Communion with God through the King Jesus Version. This will be the fourth part in my series of studies showing the importance of this uh, beloved book right here, this King James Bible, the authorized version. Could also nickname it the King Jesus Version because that's what you know, the whole book is about. It's about Jesus Christ, um, the creator of the universe, God Almighty, in other words. Um, and this study we're going to be talking about communion um, and looking at some very interesting tie-ins and things how the scriptures um, again show the extreme importance of fellowship with God through his word. So let's go first to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We read these verses in another one of the studies but we're going to go back through it again because it has our key word in it, communion, and uh, see what other key words are in this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion, there it is, hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. Another key to it there. Saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So our three key words there, communion, concord, and separate. Communion and concord basically just both mean fellowship. If you're in communion with me, then you're talking to me. You're sharing your feelings, your emotions, your, your thoughts on different things. We're in communion. Same thing with concord. We're in agreement. Okay, the Bible talks about can two walk together except they be agreed back in the book of Amos. But what's the opposite of that? We're in fellowship with each other. The opposite of that would then have to be separate. And the Bible plainly is teaching here in verse 17 that we are supposed to be separate from the lost world. We are not supposed to get along with the lost world. We're not supposed to, in terms of spiritually, I'm saying, um, it's fine to be friendly and everything to nice or, and kind to lost people. That's fine. And gentle and whatever else. But in terms of spiritual fellowship, we should not seek to be in communion with them. Uh, the Bible right here is teaching quite the opposite. And um, I brought up this point before, and I'm going to say it one more time. That's the main problem with these church buildings. That's why the whole system failed. Because you see, church buildings, they say, you know, bring in the lost world. Let's bring them in and try to get them converted. Well, the lost world comes in, and the lost world sometimes likes the people there and whatever else, but they don't really get saved. And, and so in order to feel, make the lost people feel a little bit better, they bring the standards down a little bit more. And, you know, we need to have better carpet and better lighting and better padded seats and you know, pews and everything. And uh, maybe some coffee afterwards and some donuts. And, and they keep bringing the standards down. And the standards keep coming down until pretty soon the church buildings are just filled with lost people. <laughs> Welcome to 2022. Uh, that's a big problem. But uh, our text there says that we're to be separate from the lost world. If we want to have communion with God, we have to be separate from the lost world. See, the passage isn't just about, you know, our fellowship with each other communion and concord with other believers. It's talking about communion with God. And that's what this study is going to be about. Turn next to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. A few pages over to chapter 13 of the same book. And we're going to see the thing here again. Um, what does it mean to be in communion? Beginning in verse 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, be, a, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. We're supposed to have fellowship with the Spirit, fellowshipping one with another through the Spirit of God. Which comes through what? The scriptures. That's what it's supposed to be through. You see. So we're supposed to be of one mind. And that leads to communion. 
with the Holy Spirit and ultimately back through to God, through the Spirit of God to the Godhead, in other words. How can you do that if we have lost people in our midst? It can't be done. But again, well, communion, you know, most people you say communion, most Christians, professing Christians especially would say, well, that means, um, you know, the little Last Supper thing and whatever else, the grape juice and the, the little cracker or whatever that they do in most church buildings, or some do the bread and the actual wine. Um, that's what that means. That's communion. That's a communion service. Uh, well, somewhat on the surface, yeah, you can kind of do that, and I'm, I don't have a problem with that, but there's a much deeper meaning to the, this idea of communion with God, much deeper, and that's what the study is going to be about. Let me show you. Psalm 77, Go back to Psalm 77. Back to the Old Testament here. Psalm 77. And we'll read verse 1 down through verse 6. I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord, my sore ran in the night, and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. He communes with his own heart, and his spirit made diligent search. So what does that mean? Um... You commune with your heart. The Bible says that your heart is, des is desperately wicked, deceitful, and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders. But you know, and you say, well, how do thoughts come out of your heart? It's talking there in terms of your soul, I believe, and you know your innermost feelings. In other words, um, you, when you fall in love with somebody, you say, she really took my heart. Um, I I love her with my whole heart. Well, how can a, you know, the, the blood pump in your body, you know, fall in love with somebody? It doesn't really make any logical sense. But what it's saying is there's something deep, deeper than just an intellectual, I find her very attractive and I think that she would be a good wife to me and I think that we would be able to be compatible with, you know. No, there's something very deep there. You love her from the heart. Well, same thing with the Lord. You commune with your heart and you say, huh, and you look through your mind and you say, what are my problems? What are my sins? Lord, if there's anything in me that's displeasing in thy sight, Lord, please tell me about it. Please help me to get that um, victory over that sin or whatever else. That's communion, you see. That's communing with somebody. A husband and wife are supposed to commune together. There's communion there in terms of conversation and love and, and please pour out your emotions to me. You can trust me with your deepest convictions and your feelings and whatever else. That's communion. But how do you achieve that with God? You just kind of go, just wing it and whatever else. I don't really want know what he expects of me or something. No. It comes from a book. I'll show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I mean, it's a pretty amazing thing when you think about it that the creator of the universe... Uh, would go to all the hassle of making everything so fine and intricate and detailed. And then he writes a book and tells you about it, how he did it, and what he expects from you, and what he's done for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15 through 17. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Um, for we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Um, as I said before in the other studies, blood and bread are both uh, similitudes for the scriptures. Uh, true communion with each other in the body of Christ um, and with the Lord only comes through the written word of God. <laughs> uh, that's the only way that it happens. Uh, you can be from a completely different country, a completely different culture, but if you're born again, we have fellowship through the scriptures. 
we can be of one mind with the scriptures. We can't just agree to disagree on our cultural things or on the way we dress or on, you know, my, I like cold temperatures, you like hot temperatures. or We'll never be able to get along perfectly, um, myself and other people of other cultures. But our fellowship comes with the Holy Spirit through communion with God, through His Word. That's where our fellowship comes in at. That's how you can tell somebody who's truly saved and somebody that's a false convert. Um, false converts, they will really sound good many times, but you start to press them on doctrinal issues with the Bible and you'll see them get nervous just like lost people do. I've seen that thing so many times and if you push them further, a lot of times they'll get angry and they'll yell at you and they'll say, I don't care what the Bible says. I feel this, I've been doing this for so many years and I like this and my friends all do this and whatever, shut up, get away from me. You, you're in a cult or whatever else. They'll get mad and they'll yell at you just like lost people do because they are lost. All right. Um, watch out for that. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll start in verse 17 here. Um, and go down to verse 22. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For, for, for first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are ma approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What, have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? Shall I, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. There's a lot of carnality going on there in the Corinthian church. And they're coming together and they're saying, you know, we're going to bring food in here and whatever. And Paul makes a distinction. This is not to eat the Lord's Supper. You're not doing this in remembrance of the Lord. No, it's just a thing of eating. Um, and it's causing problems. You have some people that are hungry and, and there's some guy walking by eating and whatever else. And some guy says, I'm really thirsty. Does anybody have anything to drink? And some guy's walking by and he's drinking and whatever. And there's no sharing going on and, and things. It's a problem. It's carnal. Um, I actually went to a Baptist revival meeting the one time. Uh, Peter Ruckman was speaking there. I had a video of, of it up. I, it might still be there on, on my channel. I'm not sure. But I went there, and after the service was over, they had you know food for the members of the church. And these people were walking around eating food throughout the sanctuary. And there's others that are had come down to see Peter Ruckman and we were just standing there kind of fellowshipping, but we're looking and thinking, okay, you know, they're walking around. There's no word about, you know, hey, anybody that, you know, if you're here today, just come on in, you can fellowship with us or whatever. It was just sort of, oh, no, you know, you go on, go to a restaurant or go back home or wherever you want or to the hotel or something. Um, only members of this church are supposed to have the food here or something. It was a really awkward situation. And, should they have been praised for that? No, they should not have been praised for that. Um, they were getting, you know, they need to be rebuked. Um, and what was going on there? Why was there a division there? Because they didn't have a proper respect for Scripture. A lot of people are that way. Look at verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Well, sorry to the Catholics out there, it's just in remembrance. It's not the perpetual sacrifice of, you know, the Eucharist and whatever else. And you do the transubstantiation and convert the bread and the wine into the actual you know, flesh and blood of Jesus. That's not there. It's in remembrance. And it's remembrance of Jesus too, by the way, not remembrance of your sins. That you have to continually remember your sins and go to Mass so that those sins can be washed away. That's not what Jesus was saying. Verse 25, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. All right. Um, 
what is this passage referring back to? It's referring back to Matthew chapter 26. So turn back to Matthew chapter 26 in your Bible. Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 through 28. I want you to notice some interesting things here. We'll get back to it. Um, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my body. Uh, blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Um, Jesus broke the bread, but then he gives thanks for the cup with the blood in it of the New Testament, or the blood of the New Testament, I should say. It wasn't blood in there, it's wine. But uh, an interesting thing there, because if you remember from the other studies, I believe that the Old Testament symbolizes the body, the flesh, the bread there, and the New Testament symbolizes the blood the blood of the New Testament. It literally says it right there. So what did Jesus do? He comes along and he says, okay, the Old Testament there, it's blessed. We can be thankful for it, but you know what? It's broken. It's no more. It's done. I'm putting an end to it. And you say, what are you going to do now? I'm bringing in the New Testament of my blood. I'm going to shed my blood and I'm going to make a better way. That's what happened there. A better way for what? To be in communion with God. And communion with each other. You see? Um, there wasn't a whole lot of communion with other, you know, ethnicities, races, nations, kingdoms, whatever you want to call it in the Old Testament. It was pretty much just the Jews that God was dealing with. But now we have a better way into heaven. A better way to get to be in communion with God. And that is because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, can cleanse anyone from all sin. So there's no more just, I'm dealing with the nation of Israel and forget the Gentiles out there. No, anybody can get saved. Whosoever will, the Bible teaches. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Doesn't whosoever of the Jews or whatever, no, anybody can get saved now. It's a good thing. So God broke the Old Testament. He broke the bread and then said, this is the cup of the New Testament of my blood. The New Testament comes in with the blood, shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, the death of the testator. That's what happened there. Pretty phenomenal thing. But notice also it says there in uh, verse 27, And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Okay? Not uh, some of you don't have to drink and, you know, um, you know, a few of you here, well, since you're Jews, you don't really need to drink. Everybody has to drink that blood now. You say, drink the blood? Yeah, in the sense of understanding the blood of the New Testament. You have to drink this blood of the New Testament. Fellowship with God. Eat and drink this book. It's more to be desired than my necessary food. As newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. You see, it's symbolic, obviously. You can't drink a paper book or eat a paper book. I mean, it, I guess you could eat it technically, but it'd be a little bit rough. But you can spiritually, this is more important to you than food and even something to drink. This can sustain you. It sustains you spiritually. Mark chapter 14. Let's look at another account here of the Last Supper. Mark chapter 14. Verse 22 through 24. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave it gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. They all had to. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. So there you go. Very similar. Um, again, you see that Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, and then breaks it. And then he takes the cup, which is the New Testament, and um, he gives thanks for it. Like we need to be thankful that we have the cup of the New Testament. Now let's go to Luke chapter 22. We'll see another instance of this. Luke chapter 22. 
This one's slightly different than the other, than Matthew and Mark. Luke chapter 22. Verses uh, 19 through 20. It says here, And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. So there he actually gives thanks for the Old Testament, the bread there. Um, rather interesting thing there. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 27. I'll show you another interesting tie into this whole thing. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, verse 50 through 53. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain, from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. So you read that, and you're thinking, he gave up the ghost, and then the saints arose. No, the saints arose and came into the holy city there after his resurrection. So... Um, Understand that there's a little bit of a time interval there that's not really recorded. It's just simply saying he dies on the cross, and then when he's resurrected, the Old Testament saints come up there. But it's an interesting thing. I want you to notice two things there. Um, the veil of the temple. It talks about the veil of the temple. Uh, verse 51 was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Uh, an interesting thing because what was the veil for? It was to separate the profane people from the Holy of Holies. And so now that's been ripped. Now we have direct access to God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. So we have direct access to Him, you see. And again, it's another little bit of a reference to the Old Testament. It's, bro it's broken. It's, he break the bread, you see. It's an important thing there. Um, but secondly, the, as I said before, the Old Testament saints were resurrected when the New Testament began. Hmm. They had no power to go, to go up to heaven before then, which is pretty interesting. Hebrews chapter 9, let's go there. Hebrews chapter 9. We've covered some of this before, but we're going to go through this again. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 through 14. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of gold of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest, alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Which we talked about, that's what the veil was about there. Which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of ref reformation. But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once un into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience? from dead works to serve the living God. 
Okay, now we've been over that before. Jesus put an end to the Old Testament system. He fulfilled it. They could not be perfect concerning their conscience by sacrificing animals. The animal sacrifices, they did what God told them to do, but it was all foreshadowing what would one day come, that God himself will provide a lamb. All right, that was the prophecy that was given to Abraham when he was going to sacrifice Isaac, his son. God is going to provide himself a lamb. Okay, very important to understand that. Look at verse 15, Hebrews chapter 9, verse, verse 15. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For a where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Um, another one of the greatest portions in your New Testament, proving dispensationalism. There's a different dispensation there. You say, when does the New Testament start? I love to ask this to the uh, non-dispensational guys, the ones that are really pridefully, we're non-dispensational. It's all the same, Genesis to Revelation. Okay, when did the New Testament start? They say, Matthew chapter 1. No, that's when the collection of books that are called the New Testament, that's when that started. The New Testament begins with the death of the testator. And you take them right here, Hebrews 9, 15 through 17, and it blows their minds. And they, I never saw that before. <laughs> yeah. Verse 18, let's continue. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkling and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was, off, was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Jesus Christ only shows up twice for you if you're a sinner. Once on the cross and the second time when you call upon him. That's all you're going to get. Those are the two chances. Okay, Jesus doesn't have to come and say, I'm here, you know, sacrifice me again, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Okay, then we're going to do the same thing tomorrow, all right? Same time, same place. Uh, no, that's ridiculous heresy. One time is all that it took. Now, I need to make another point here. If Jesus shed his blood once for the remission of sins, and the blood is the cup of the New Testament, then why would you need more than one New Testament? Well, I prefer the King James Bible for, you know, uh, poetic, you know, readability, but uh, I prefer the New American Standard Version for uh, accuracy, and I prefer the NIV for sort of a dynamic equivalence and, and the message for the people that are, you know, have lost their brains because of pot or something. Um, no, there's one New Testament. It doesn't need to be redone over and over again. <laughs> Just thought I'd add that in there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's go back there again. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians 11, verse 27 through 29. Let's go back to this. Trying to understand what it means to be in communion with the Lord. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. 
But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, traditional, if you're a Catholic, the interpretation is there. You're taking the Mass, you know, the Eucharist there, you're taking it unworthily. You're not a you know, confirmed member of the church. Uh, so therefore, you're you know, eating and drinking damnation to yourself. You're, you receive an anathema from, for that. You don't genuinely believe that it's the flesh and blood of Jesus. That's a Catholic interpretation. A Catholic inter interpretation is you're not properly examining your life and you have some sins that are unconfessed and therefore um, you're not really discerning the Lord's body in communion, remembering what he did on the, on the cross, his death. You know, he's, he died, his flesh died, and he shed his blood um, there. So because you're not confessing the sins, then you're, the eating and drinking damnation to yourself means not damnation eternally, but just kind of damnation for this life here. Um, <laughs> a little bit of a, another thing there. Um, a little bit better, but not really, still not really hitting it there. Um, what's really going on? Well, I believe what the real meaning of that passage is after going through this whole study. Um, if you are reading this book as a lost sinner and you're not believing that it's God's word, you're not really um, understanding how important this book is, um, then you're guilty of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Body being the Old Testament, the blood being the New Testament. You're rejecting the book because it's to, to you it's just an intellectual thing. And therefore, you get damnation to yourself. Um, and of course, obviously, sin, unconfessed sin, would go in with that, obviously. But I think it's more than just a, a thing of you, you know, because you'd have to basically go to in, into some kind of a church building and or whatever, or go to be around other Christians, which you shouldn't be doing anyhow, and partake unworthily of the, you know, the grape juice and the cracker or the wine and the bread, and you know, how do you do that? You know, it's, it's kind of a weird thing. And a lot of people just don't even bother with that. I've talked to countless people that don't, I've never even been in a church building. I could care less about going, you know. Um, but what do you think about the Bible? You see. And if they pick up this book, they don't discern the Lord's body. They don't think this is about, the, about Jesus Christ back here in the Old Testament. And this New Testament is about him and, his, and the blood that he shed to pay for my sins. So they're approaching this thing unworthily, you see, and that therefore they receive to themselves damnation. I believe is the proper way to uh, interpret that. John chapter 14, let's go there. And I'll back up what I'm saying here about 1 Corinthians chapter 10, or uh, chapter 11, I mean. Yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20, 27 through 29. Covered up my notes there. Um, John chapter 14, verse 15, down through verse 26. We'll see this thing again of the fact that the Holy Ghost must be inside you in order for you to understand God's Word. Let's see about this. First Corinthians, or, uh, yeah, John chapter 14, verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. The world cannot have communion with God. We're supposed to be separate from the lost world. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, Not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? How are we going to have communion, and it doesn't get over to the world? How does that make sense? If Jesus said, I am going to come to town and appear to you this, this weekend, how are you going to come and appear and in a way that I see you, but other people don't see you? That's 
basically there what he's saying, Judas is saying, not Judas Iscariot, in other words, from the context there. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, the written scripture, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your, your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Second Corinthians 13, communion with the Holy Ghost. That's what's going on here. Do you keep the written word of God? Do you understand? Do you discern the Lord's body in here? I mean, you know, this whole thing just is such an amazing thing to think on because, you know, if you have somebody, let's just say I wrote an autobiography about myself, right? And I came up, or somebody comes walking up to me and they say, hey, I just got done reading this autobiography of yours. And you know what? I reject it. There's a lot of things in there that are not accurate. There's contradictions. There's... Obviously, there's spelling errors. There's all kinds of different things here. I like you, Brian, but I, I just can't accept this autobiography. I can't accept certain details about your life and who you are. Well, then how could you say you like me or love me even when you reject the book that's written about me, that I wrote myself? Huh? How does that make any sense? You see how little sense it would make for somebody to say, I love Jesus, but I reject this King James Bible. That doesn't make any sense at all. And that's why the Lord is saying there's a very serious warning here. If you reject this book, if you reject what you're reading, then there's no communion. We have nothing to discuss. You're not one of mine. I don't know you. You're going to receive damnation. If you believe that this book is just a man-made book, you're in trouble. You're in very big trouble. Let's see some more about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. See how well it lines up with what we just read here in John chapter 14, verse 15 through 26. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is how things work as a Bible believer if you're just newly saved. Um, you have to compare Scripture with Scripture. So you're cherry-picking verses. No, I'm comparing Scripture with Scripture. Okay, I'm not taking verses out of context. First Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. What's the testimony of God? Scriptures. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. How do you demonstrate the Holy Spirit if you don't have the Bible? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I believe that this book was inspired by God. Well, I think a better translation would be, Oh, you're trying to get me over to your wisdom, you mean? Oh, I think a Greek word, you don't understand the shades and nuances of the particular translational choice here. And the, and the, see, all those guys are trying to get you over to their wisdom, not the power of God. Verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, not academia and everything else. I'm from a seminary. I have a PhD and a THD and I'm doctor so-and-so. Well, I'm sorry about that. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Um, what I'm speaking to you in these series of studies, it's the wisdom of God. Okay, It's not my own wisdom. I'm comparing Scripture with Scripture. I'm showing what the Bible says about itself. It's very important. And it's hidden from the lost world. Remember what Judas said? How are you going to manif manifest your, you, yourself there, Lord Jesus? How are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Because the Holy Spirit's going to come in and He's going to have communion with you. You see? And it's not because you went to 
a communion service and did the Last Supper and whatever else. That's not communion. That's not in terms of the, that spiritual fellowship. That's It's there somewhat because you're examining yourself and seeing what sins you have and trying to get that, you know, forgiven and whatever else. But the real communion comes through the Word of God. Verse 8, Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Uh, God keeps things hidden from the lost world. If the lost world really understood what this book was truly offering, there wouldn't be any lost people out there. But you see, there's a lot of people that they do wicked things, and God says, okay, I'm going to hide from you. I'm actually going to hide the truth from you. Oh, God wouldn't do a thing like that. Uh, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, yes, God would do that. Yes, God will hide the truth from people so that they will get, end up in hell. You can tick God off to the point where he says, you are so wicked. There's a conscience there that you're supposed to know. The law of God is written on every man's heart and every woman's heart out there. It's there. And you start getting people that just sear their conscience and they say, I don't want, any, I don't want God in my life. I don't want, God is not in all their thoughts, you know. Um, you get to a point where God just says, okay, I'm going to hide from you. Verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Do you ever get a good feeling about heaven? I've had some times where I'm really down and I start thinking about heaven and thinking about what we know from the book of Revelation and a few other places where it talks about heaven. But I think, I wonder what else is up there. <laughs> and you start to get really happy. There's some joy there some hope you think wow i bet it's really going to be something can't can't imagine i've been to some pretty wealthy places and whatever around the united states and um some other countries not i've never been to really wealthy other countries <laughs> central america um but uh you know i've seen some pretty you know ornate places and whatever else and been around some of the rich people and things and and i think it isn't anything like what heaven is going to be the God of heaven, and he creates it up there. It's his realm. It's going to be amazing. Verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. What we're talking about right now is the deep things of God. Verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God that we're supposed to have communion with. And you can commune with the Holy Spirit all the time with this. I mean, if communion is just the, you know, drinking the wine, eating the bread, um, if that's all that it is, what do you do when you're at work? You can meditate on the scriptures. Lunch break, you can read the Bible. You can listen to the Bible sometimes, depending on what work you do. You can listen to preaching. That's communion with the Holy Spirit. Communion is not this celebrating the Lord's Supper thing alone. That is there. Again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do communion or something else. But understand what the Bible is really saying here. It's a lot deeper than just the thing of, you know, the, we celebrate the Last Supper when we get together or something like that. Verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. The Comforter, He comes. He gives you communion. Fellowship between us and the Lord. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You realize the whole reason that uh, the devil and his servants they come out with these because this is too hard to understand so we have to make it more understandable to the lost world um no uh first corinthians 2 verse 14 says the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of god they're foolishness to him how can you write dumb down the bible so a lost man can read it and understand it 
It's not possible. You see, it's a satanic little motivation that they're doing. It's all about money. That's the real truth of it. But they, oh, well, you know, the King James Bible is just so archaic that lost people can't understand it. Um, no, the Bible is not understandable. It, you know, if God had brought the Bible out in modern English, it still wouldn't be understandable to the lost world out there. And if there are lost people watching this video, they're just simply not going to understand what I'm saying. They're going to come out saying it's a heresy and Denlinger's a bigger nut than we thought before and whatever else. If you're saved, you're understanding and you're nodding your head and saying, I never thought about it this way before. Wow, yeah, the communion thing. Wow. Fellowship with God through his word, through the Holy Spirit there. Amazing. Let's continue here. Verse 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Hmm. And what is the mind of Christ, by the way? The Bible talks about the spirit of your mind. Hmm. Do you think the mind of Christ might actually be a reference to the Holy Spirit? And the fellowship that we have with God? You say, well, uh, how does that work, though? I mean, how do we have fellowship with uh, God and things? How do we stay in good fellowship? Well, I don't know. Verse 15, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. We'll see that here in a little bit. We go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Self-judgment. Well, how do you judge yourself if you don't have a perfect standard? Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26, down to verse 31. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, um, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and he said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Um, the Ethiopian eunuch was a lost man who could not understand the scriptures. Philip didn't come over and say, Oh, it's, I'm sorry, it's a little bit archaic. Let me just kind of rewrite it for you, and then you can you know, maybe understand it better. He couldn't understand the scriptures. He was honest. And lost people, the truth of the matter is, um, they're not supposed to understand this book. They're not supposed to be in communion with God, you see. There's no fellowship there. We're supposed to be separate from them. Oh, well, you know, I have to try to get along with my lost relatives and whatever else. I'm trying my hardest, Brother Brian. I don't know what else to do. We just can't get along. <laughs> That's the way it's supposed to be, brethren. Um, you can be kind to lost people. Don't get me wrong. You know, hey, how's the weather doing or something? You know, you don't have to scream heretic in their face or anything. Talk to them. Try to, if you're talking about something, Pray in the back of your mind and say, Lord, give me an open door here. Give me a chance to witness to them. Have them say something that I can, you know, say something back and try to bring up the gospel or something like that. But if they're not open to it, then there's not much you can do about it. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29. It says here, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. I read that before, but I had to read it again to get into context for verse 30. For this cause, what just preceded it, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Okay? Um, Sleep, of course, in context there means that they're dead. Now, let me ask you a question. 
at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 down to verse 34, um, if that passage right here, this passage that we're in, if it's about the Lord's Supper and that's it, then basically you would have to teach that the Lord's Supper is so important that if you don't um, regularly do that and regularly examine yourself and whatever else and you know take the actual physical wine and bread, if you don't do that, then for that cause... Um, you eat and drink unworthily, in other words, uh, because you're not discerning the Lord's body. Um, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Um, well, I'm going to reveal a little secret about us here. Um, I haven't done any kind of a little Lord's Supper type of a thing since uh, we were living at Bridgewater, um, which is many years ago. It's been, I don't even know what, maybe three or four years, maybe, maybe longer, um, back, maybe even five years. I don't, I'm not even sure when it was, uh, since we've done, you know, any kind of thing with the Lord's Supper. Am I weak? Am I sickly? Am I dead? Am I sleeping? No. Am I seriously out of fellowship with the Lord? No communion with the Holy Spirit? No. One of the most detailed studies of my entire life was just revealed to me by the Lord. And I haven't done any kind of a communion service. You see, again, I'm not saying it's wrong to do the bread and the wine and things and, and examine yourself and think about it. Um, but brethren, that's not what the text is talking about. I don't really, I don't believe that. There's the Lord's Supper in context. That's there. But it switches. And you have to understand things. See, we are commanded as Christians to Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Understand that the one thing about Scripture, the way it's written, when God says, I'm going to reveal things to the saved and the lost world, they're going to read it and then they won't get it. Because the Holy Spirit has to be there to guide you and say, okay, this is to be taken literal, this is to be taken symbolic, this is for the future, this is about the past, this is for you today, this is a challenge, this is condemning your sin, Brian. It's, the Holy Spirit's there, that's the communion, you see. So what we're reading here is some application to that you could do uh, the Lord's Supper, remembrance, and remembrance of what he did. That's fine, that's absolutely fine. But if you don't do that, you're not going to get to a point where you're sick and weakly and, and you eventually sleep. What would lead to that if you get away from reading this book? You, you fail to, to uh, discern the Lord's body. Old Testament, New Testament, here. You stop discerning the Lord's body and you start to basically live in sin and you get away from this book here. You will get weak, you will get sickly, and you will eventually sleep if you don't stop. I remember there was a Baptist church years ago I went to long before I knew my wife and um, they would always do the their communion service, you know, the Last Supper service, if you could be more biblically accurate. They would do that at night because that's when the faithful, you know, every single week they did it at night. And that was when the faithful people came, you know, so they wouldn't do it Sunday morning because then unfaithful people might drink of the bread and the, and the you know, grape juice. They didn't use wine. Um, but... Just weird. The stuff that people do and, you know, I mean, you see the Lord when he's down here on the earth and he's just getting frustrated so many times with his disciples. And oh, How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? <laughs> he still feels the same way. Um, there are people that mean well, but they just, they don't quite get it. And, um, you know, so go next to Revelation chapter 3. Say, I don't know, Brian. I, I don't agree. I think that the communion service is very important. It's a time of self-reflection. You judge your sins and whatever else, and you need to do that in remembrance of the Lord. I don't think it's just about reading Scripture. Well, there's some application there that you could do that. I think it's okay, but uh, it's not just about that. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 through 20. Speaking to the church of Laodicea. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. 
because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Okay? Stop there for just a minute. There's a lot of people that think that things are going good in their life. They think that they're in fellowship with the Lord, that they're in communion with God. They're not. They're not. Oh, the Holy Spirit's in my life, and He's blessed me with all this stuff. Uh, are you in God's Word? Are you studying God's Word? Well, not a whole lot. Maybe not as much as I should. You know. Oh, then you have a problem. You don't really understand your true spiritual condition. But what's the advice? Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. You can sup with the Lord. Feast on his word. The Lord's not saying, hey, I'm outside standing here and I have a bottle of Welsh's grape juice and a few oyster crackers or something. You know, let me in, we'll do communion together. That's not what he's saying. <laughs> okay? Um, being zealous and repenting requires a standard that you can follow. John chapter 14. Go back to John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 23 is where we're going to read. John 14, verse 23 and 24. Let's look at this again. Remember it said, Sup, over there in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hears is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Um, you have to keep God's word. I mean, compare the two passages here in Revelation chapter three. It's saying the same thing. We'll come unto you. The Father will come and we'll we'll be there. We'll fellowship with you. We'll sup with you. And it's tied in with reading the Word of God. Well, I just don't know if I want to read the Word of God. Well, John chapter fifteen verses one through eight. I am the true vine, and the Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it, might bring, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing." If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye may bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Uh, you have to continually stay in a perpetual state of massification. <laughs> uh, you know, go to Mass and whatever else and consider your sins and, oh, Father, forgive me for I have sinned, you know, and do the auricular confession first. And then you have to go out and take the Mass and, you know, the everything else. They have consecrate the host and transubstantiation, make it magically turn into the actual physical flesh and blood of Jesus, which would be satanic heresy if they did. You can't drink flesh and, and you know, blood. You're not supposed to drink that and eat that. Um, Jesus was talking about reading his word. Uh, that's what it's talking about there. And you can have that continually in your mind. You can hide God's word in your heart. You can quote scripture. And it will keep you from getting messed up in sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Go back there again. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 31 and 32. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Um, let me say it this way. 
Again, I've used this in other studies. If God said, I'm going to come to your house tonight, make sure that things are right for me when I get there. I would think most people, if they have any sense to them at all, any common sense, they would probably say, God wants me to have it right for him when he, go, when he shows up. Maybe I should try to look through the scriptures and see what his standards are. Maybe I should try to look through and see what the Bible says about what he expects. What does, does the Bible say anything about the kind of food that he likes to eat? Does the Bible say anything about the kind of atmosphere that he likes? The kind of music that he likes? The kind of whatever? Does he like it hot? Does he like it cold? I mean, I want to have everything just perfect for the God of heaven. See? Um, how do you do that if you don't have his word? I'll just kind of wing it. I'll kind of do what I like and hopefully God will like the same things. If you want communion with the Holy Spirit of God and that fellowship that comes as a result of that that the lost world can't have, there's only one way to have it. And that's it right there. The Bible. And um, if you don't discern the Lord's body in this book and you just take this book and you say, oh, well, you know, I like the King James Bible sometimes, but I, I like other ones too. Um, you're not right with God. It's just that simple. So hopefully this series of studies has been a great conviction to you out there, understanding how important it is to be in the Word of God. If you are not in the Word of God on a daily basis, um, you're going to have a major problem in your life. So, we have one more study to do in this series for now, unless uh, you out there, if you put some your thoughts down in the comments and say, well, what about this? I, maybe this ties in with the whole theme of the importance of the King Jesus version here. Uh, what about some of these passages? Well, maybe then it'll go to another study or two or whatever else. But um, the last study that I have for now is called The Cup of the Lord versus The Cup of Devils. And... Um, it gets into, again, the thing of the cup of the New Testament and how it relates to the cup of devils um, and the danger of going with other versions and the danger of not reading this blessed book right here and not believing that it's God's perfect word. Uh, so, all the way through this, brethren, you have to remind yourself of a few concepts of Scripture that are very simple to understand. Jesus Christ never said that the vast majority are going to be saved and that the vast majority goes to heaven. All right, It's a narrow uh, path, a narrow road that which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. All right, Jesus never said that there's going to be just, oh boy, just billions and billions of Christians in heaven and whatever else. There's very few people that ever really truly get saved. Okay, You have to understand that. Um, you can say whatever you want, but that's the truth. Um, well, there's a lot of Christians out there, Brother Brian. There's a lot of people that believe in Jesus. They believe what the Bible says about Jesus. Um, okay, but for whatever reason, God doesn't save them. And I think it's because they have a very poor attitude towards this book. I mean, think about the God of the new version people out there. Think of, about the idiot that these people worship. He can't make up his mind. He has to continually update his word, especially because there's, you know, pronouns that might be offensive to certain people. You know, Oh, God, you know, the, the old Bible that used to be there, oh, it was so offensive because it said brethren. We need to change brethren to brothers and sisters, you know. I guess God's up there in heaven saying, yes, my name is God. My pronouns are he and him. Um, and I identify as the creator of the universe or the creator of the heavens and earth. I'll say it that way, to use biblical terms. Um, and I'm wearing a white robe today or something, <laughs> Uh, no, no, uh, that's a bunch of wicked perverts down here on the earth. That's not the God of heaven. All right. Um, there's a book that God inspired. There's a book that God bears witness to that the Holy Spirit will do things for the people that read and believe this book. And it's not going to change. God's not going to all of a sudden change his mind. And these modern professing Christians that just have however many versions and no version is perfect, no version is inspired, and I'll just keep deciding what I prefer through my life. 
Uh, that's Satan's lie. Always remember that. They can come up with some arguments sometimes that you aren't going to be able to answer, and you'll say, well, I don't know what to say about that, and I don't know. Just like the disciples that left Jesus when they started to get some doubts. This is a hard saying. Who can you know, accept this? Who can take this? I, I, ah, man, I don't know. I've been following this Jesus guy for a while, but he did some really good miracles, but he's getting weird with this eat my flesh, drink my blood thing, you know. I mean, this this ministry was a good ministry, but this all this uh, perfect King James Bible stuff, and I can't use the new versions, and other people that use the new versions are going to hell, and I don't know if I can follow this anymore. Why? Does it scare you having only one book, only one authority in your life? Does it scare you that there's a God in heaven that can have fellowship with you through his Holy Spirit, and he can tell you off through his word? And he tells everybody off, by the way. I can't tell you how many times the Lord has told me off. Hey, you're really in sin here, Brian. Look what you're doing. Why did you just, why'd you do that? Why'd you listen to that? Why'd you watch that? that come on here. That goes against my word. What are you thinking? Get those dirty thoughts out of your life, boy. What are you, pro I'm sorry, Lord. I can't believe I did that. I'm sorry. I See, that's what scares the false converts, that continual daily thing of staying in fellowship with the Lord, the communion with the Lord. That's why a lot of people didn't really want to be around Jesus. I mean, how would you like to be around some guy? He created you, and he, can, he knows all your thoughts. I mean, would you want to be, you women out there, would you want to be married to a man that knows all of your thoughts? sit down at the table and everything he starts eating and he looks over to you and he says no I'm not lazy and I don't appreciate you thinking that <laughs> oh, that's right he, he can read my thoughts oh no and he looks at you again and he says that's correct I can read your thoughts don't forget that please <laughs> do you want to be in fellowship with somebody like that we well, are if you're saved do you realize how much God has grace for you <laughs> you know Ugh, you know, it's really something. So, the last and final study will be next. It will be the cup of the Lord versus the cup of devils, as I said earlier. Um, but I just really want to encourage you, brethren. Um, if you believe the King James Bible is God's perfect word, then you're on the right path. If you know what I mean. Um, don't ever give up your King James Bible, no matter what arguments the devil and his servants can come up with. Um, it's a great book the greatest book that's ever been written in the history of the world. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.